<laughs> all shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. And Ian said to me, that's the last thing I said to Bill before he passed over. You're telling me that he's come back to say, yes, Ian, Juliana was absolutely right, and I'm there. Well, you could imagine, we sat there looking at each other like a couple of waxworks. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Ian said, I think I'd better open a nice bottle of wine, Father. I think we made it. <laughs> and so we did. And that is an absolutely factual account of my experience and what Ian said to me afterwards. Wow, that is amazing. So do you believe in reincarnation? Yes, I think that it can happen. I've come across so many pieces of evidence of uh, a person, usually a young child, uh, with abnormal abilities, the abilities that an adult would have had in a previous life, and the um, memories occasionally. One of the classic examples concerned a young boy in India who... Um, told his parents that in the previous life he had been someone else in another state and they were so um, fascinated by his certainty that that was who he had been that they took him over to the area where he said he had lived as an adult in his previous life. He led them unerringly to the house that he said had been his when his name was totally different and his life was different and one of his brothers came to the door, and this little boy greeted him by name and knew mm. him as a brother from a previous life. Now, they're not all as strong as that, but there are many other pieces of evidence that suggest reincarnation as the best solution to the mystery. I also wonder just how much data and detail can live inside the DNA and that it's possible that we may inherit, just as some people inherit an artistic talent, they're born with an ability to draw or paint or carve statues, someone else is born with amazing musical ability. Now, that may simply be a fortuitous juxtaposition of the nerve cells in the youngster, or it could well be that they have reincarnated and brought with them some of their previous knowledge and some of their previous right. ability. Put it this way, I regard it as a strong possibility. I don't think it happens to all of us. I don't think it happens on a very wide scale necessarily, but I think it may happen on some occasions. Okay. Okay. Wow, that's a that's a crazy story. <laughs> um so do you believe that each soul has a soul mate or a twin flame? Yes. I believe that we do. Um as you were saying in that very kind and generous introduction to me that you gave in the program um, I've been with Patricia for 57 years, and uh, we've been married for 57 years. We've known each other a lot longer than that. And when you are in love to that depth, you just feel that you are almost one being rather than two, that you are... Um, you know that in nature, if we look at certain life forms which exist in groups. There's um, some very interesting speculative work done on whether an ant colony or a bee colony um, had one mind that was bigger than the hundreds or thousands of separate individuals that made it up. Now, I believe that as a corollary to this, there may be certain people who literally belong together. I feel when we are together, when Patricia and I are together, doing a job together, we, we, we work together, we're a very, very happy family unit, we love being parents and grandparents together, 
um, it's just that you feel that maybe, but sometimes we've raised the question, did this only start during our current lives? Or, and we're going back to your point about reincarnation, right. that were we together in uh, an earlier life, when I did a hypno-regression on uh, one occasion, one of the characters that the hypno-regression uh, experimenter dredged out of my subconscious uh, was a Templar knight who had mm. joined the Templars and was doing his best to get himself killed by being the first to attack and the last to retreat in every time there was a battle because he had recently been widowed after many, many years of happy marriage to the lady of his dreams, and he would not, under any circumstances, commit suicide. He was too strong a man for that. But he wanted to be with her again in the next world. And so during this piece that came through the hypno-regression, uh, he was always leading the charge. And uh, if any of his comrades were badly outnumbered, he was the first man to rush in with an axe in one hand and a sword in the other and lay the Saracens low in all directions. Now, that was so vivid when I recorded, I had no idea what I was, I was out under the hypno-regression, and I had no idea what I was saying until we played the tape back. But I felt a great deal of, shall we say, fellow feeling, sympathy, empathy with this character who had gone out to do that. And I think that we do have soulmates. And if somebody like the guy in my hypno-regression had lost his life companion, the one who was more to him than his own existence, then I can understand why he went out and did what he did. Yeah. And uh, yes, I certainly believe that we do have, um, you know, when, when you take the religious teaching, which says that God is love, that God is the personification of love, I believe that the most important thing in any of our lives is that kind of love, whether it's with a loving partner, whether it's a devoted parent with a son or daughter, whether it's loving brothers or sisters in a happy family. There are experiences of love which transcend anything and everything else in life. So I would go along with your question and saying, do we have these perfect companions who we are just meant to be with and who are meant to be with us? And I would, I would suggest, yes, we do. Perfect. Okay. Do you believe that all of us have guardian angels that are constantly protecting us? Well, if I may revert back to that uh, anecdote that I gave you about my friend Billy Farrow, who died and who then, you know, with the Lady Juliana piece, and he then appeared to me in uh, Father Ian's study. Bill, when he was young and fit, was the best driver I have ever met. He was absolutely superb. He could well have been a champion racing driver had he decided to do that instead of becoming a teacher. He had a kind of instinct. He was just a brilliant driver. When I was driving back from Cambridge to Cardiff, after laying Bill to rest by that little village church near Cambridge, I was overtaking a big 40-ton Arctic on this three-lane motorway, and it was Scandinavian. So the driver was on the left, the left-hand drive, and it was also one of those huge articulated heavy goods lorries where the cab is way up above the engine at the front so that the driver's feet 
were pretty well on the same level as the roof of my car. And as he was also well over on the left, he would not have seen that there was a car overtaking him on his right. And he suddenly changed lanes while I was halfway past him. Hit the back of my... I was driving a big Ford Granada, which was my pride and joy, and he swung over into the back of my Granada, hit my back wheel on the passenger side, swung me through 90 degrees, and pushed me sideways up the road, still blissfully unaware that he had got a car trapped on his bull bars on the front. And... I tried everything I could think of to get off, and I couldn't. One of my tires ripped off sideways, and uh, I say with a certain amount of pride, I wasn't frightened. I just thought, oh, well, this is it. I'm going to see the next world and uh, answer the great mysteries. And then, if you've ever taught a friend to drive, you will sometimes put your hand over his on the wheel and say, just bring her in a bit. Or you'll put your hand over his on the stick shift and you'll say, just go down a gear. And there are good and caring driving instructors who will actually guide their students by putting a hand on that area of control to guide the student to do the right thing. Quite suddenly... I felt a very gentle hand on top of mine on the wheel. And I responded to every touch I was being. And I was also being, as it were, guided as to what to do with my feet on the clutch and the brake. And within something like 10 or 15 seconds, I had come free from the front of this huge 40-ton Arctic I'd gone over the hard shoulder, over a ditch, and halfway up a hedge, and the car stopped. And I hadn't the slightest injury, not any whiplash, no nothing. She was so badly buckled, I had to kick the doors open to get out. But I scrambled out, and the driver of the Arctic came running back down the road, and in a lovely Swedish accent, I am so sorry, I did not seize his use. <laughs> I, said, I, I said, I'm okay, I'm not hurt, the car's insured, what the heck. And I looked up heavenwards, and I couldn't resist saying, Bill, was that your first job as my guardian angel? And I could <laughs> almost imagine him saying to the angel who was showing him around heaven, can you excuse me a moment? My friend is really a biker. <laughs> he doesn't drive it. a car as well as I do. May I go and help him? <laughs> and if it. ever there was a guardian angel, it was my pal Billy Farrer coming back from paradise to rescue me. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. Again, okay, so absolutely true and detailed account. That's awesome. I'll, seriously, I love your story. <laughs> I am fixated on, on every word that you say. Um, are there universal laws that govern this universe? And can we use these laws to manipulate the world around us? I think that we can. Now, if we go back through human history, and we go back to the days of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, and then to the next stage of development, 